In the 12th chapter of Romans, the Apostle Paul gives us an antidote for the epidemic of fear in us and in our society. Hear this exciting word beginning with the ninth verse. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligent, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continually steadfast in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, thus saith the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy hungers, feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Thus saith the Lord, let us pray. Gracious Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Fill us with your power so that we will be able to communicate peace and hope and courage to others. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Do people ever frustrate you? I don't know why you're smiling. <laughs> we all get frustrated with people, especially when we see things that they do and say and are that we'd like to change. We try and figure out ways of changing them and often get frustrated by the methods that uh, we use and their lack of response. I talked to a man who was very disappointed with someone at work. And uh, he said, that man's got to change. And I said, how are you going to help him change? And he said, listen, I'm going to scare the hell out of him and I'm going to put the fear of God into him. Well, I said, my friend, uh, you don't have either to give, either the power to uh, take hell out of him or to put heaven into him. Have you ever felt fear when somebody's tried to change you? Have you ever felt that panic in your soul when someone has tried to manipulate you with fear rather than motivate you with love? Oh, you know how it takes place. And however it's stated, it goes something like this. If you don't, I won't. Or, if you don't do what I say, you're not going to have what you want. Oh, it happens in marriages all the time. If you don't carry out the garbage, you cannot expect any affection from me tonight in bed. <laughs> or more serious than that.
if you don't pay the bills, you can't expect me to do what you want me to do. Happens with our kids all of the time. We'd like them to be paragons of virtue. We've never achieved the status, but we want them to have it. And uh, we keep uh, pushing them, cajoling them, trying somehow to get them to change to be what we want them to be. And very often we work the quid pro quo on them, saying, if you do this, I'll give you that. And it can be anything from the use of the car to their name on our wills for part of the inheritance. But we manipulate. It happens with our friends. I want you to do something for me, and if you do, I'll do something for you. And the whole fabric, the warp and woof of our society is built together on the old quid pro quo, which means if you do, I will. If you don't, I won't. And so it goes. We're raised with that as little children. We grow up with it. It's everywhere. Bartered love. Equivocating relationships. It happens to us in our work. Listen, if you don't change your ways, you're going to get a demotion. I'm going to move you to an entirely different office and cut your pay, and if you don't change, you're going to get fired. Now, the alternative to that is spending a little time and caring and loving and getting some goals focused and helping a person become all that he or she was meant to be. Strange, isn't it, how when we give up on a person, instead of motivating with love, we manipulate with fear. T.S. Eliot said, here's the greatest treason to do the right thing for the wrong reason. I'd like to suggest here's the greatest treason to manipulate for the wrong reason. And yet we are manipulators. However subtly we do it, we are constantly holding out for people the promise of something if they'll do what we want them to do. Children manipulate parents. Parents manipulate children. Employers manipulate those who work for them. All because we have lost the capacity of motivation. Well, if we were to become motivators, what would we do? The Apostle Paul has given us a list of important things to do in order to help people to be all that God has created them to be. He begins by asking us to have love that is authentic. That simply suggests that uh, we can't give away something we have not experienced. Before you ever attempt to manipulate Consider the possibility of motivating people by the power of his love. But it's equally true that we can't motivate someone in a quality of life we are not discovering in fresh ways every day of our lives. The Apostle Paul says, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, but cling to what is good. And then he talks about brotherly affection to one another. He talks about being diligent, strong in the spirit, faithful in prayer, giving ourselves and what we have a way that we might be able to communicate to people the immense potential of their lives. Daniel Webster said, the most exciting discovery of my life was that God knows about me, and I can know about him. Everything that we long for for people is in that basic, essential relationship that makes everything else possible. Here's the thesis, then. People do what they do because of what they are. People can't change what they do until they change what they are, and people can't change what they are until 
God changes them with the power of love. And so the Apostle Paul goes on and says, bless and do not curse. I want to suggest that the absence of blessing is a curse. To bless is to speak a good word. That's what the Greek word means. A good word on behalf of another person, a good word to God for another person, a good word about another person. I want to ask you a question. Are you known as someone who speaks good words about others? Are you a blesser or a condemner? Now, just remember that people are listening all the time, and they're deciding whether you can help them change on the basis of what they hear you say about other people. Now, recently we've been through some pretty hard times in America. Political leaders, religious leaders have run into some very serious difficulty. And wherever I go, I hear people demeaning, condemning, pushing down. Well, all I can say is, there but for God's grace go I. And in some of the things that people haven't accomplished that I'd like them to accomplish, I can say, there but for me go I. A gossip will lose one of the most precious gifts of life, the gift of being able to help other people. Because the minute we condemn someone else in the presence of another person, that person is registering in his or her mind, this person is not worthy of my trust. So you may have already blown it, but you might want to start to reestablish your credentials by asking God to give you lockjaw when it comes <laughs> to demeaning other people in the presence of those you want to help. So often we try and get that we feeling with people we want to help, and we push everyone else down and trample all over them and assassinate their character, and then expect another person to say, oh, now here's somebody who could really help me. Not at all. They've seen your scalpel swishing back and forth, cutting people up. It happens to all of us. Then the Apostle Paul goes on and he says, be of one mind with one another. What does that mean but to discover what's uh, going on inside of another person, to feel his or her hurts and hopes, struggles and cares, and get over that fence that divides us and over where they are to stand as an ally of the best that God has for that person. How many people in your life know that you are for them, regardless? There's nothing like affirmation and encouragement. Affirmation gives a person a sense of his value and worth, potential. Do you encourage that in others? Do they feel that when they are with you, they are worth something? They can dare to try again? Are you an affirmer or a negator? Are you a lift or a load? A burden or a boost? I want you to answer that because we have been called to be to others what Christ has been to us. And our capacity to receive more of his affirming, encouraging, empowering love is decided on the basis of our willingness to give it away. The Apostle Paul goes on. He says, don't be high-minded, but associate with the humble. Actually, the Greek means be carried along by lowly things. Now, he doesn't mean get down and grovel in other people's mistakes and repeat them. Rather, he calls us to vulnerability. There's nothing more powerful than a friend who dares to share with you his own pilgrimage and is open to share some of the hurts in his own life. So we become fellow strugglers rather than someone who's above and over the other person, doling out wisdom and demanding performance and 
checking up with accountability. Instead, we say, hey, I want to share in the adventure of you discovering all that you were meant to be because people have done that for me and it's happening in my life right now. Speaking of vulnerability, have you heard the story about the woman who was going to uh, take a trip downtown from her home? Her husband said, watch out for that certain street. It's a speed trap. A friend of mine got a ticket there, and I want you to be very careful. No speeders in this family. Well, she was cleaning out his suit uh, a few days afterwards to take it to the cleaners, and she found a ticket in his pocket. Well, about a week after that, uh, she got a traffic ticket, and she came to her husband and said, remember that friend you told me about uh, who uh, got a speeding ticket? Well, his wife just got one. <laughs> so often we try and pretend that we've got it all together when we haven't. Do you remember the story of the old uh, pious man who asked a boy to row him across a river? It was a wide river. It was a dangerous waterfall, and so the boy had to row very hard and vigorously and uh, as, after they got into the boat, the man picked up a leaf uh, out of the water and said, uh, young man, uh, do you know anything about the marvels of nature? And the young man said, I don't know. And uh, they rowed a little bit further and saw some fish in the water. And the man said, do you know marine biology, lad? And he said, well, I don't think I do, sir. And uh, then he looked up and saw an evening star coming out early and said to the boy, uh, do you know anything about stars and the constellations? And the little boy said, I don't know very much about it. By this time, the boat had drifted down toward the waterfall. And the little boy said, uh, sir, do you know how to swim? <laughs> and the man said, no. And the little boy said, uh, you said my life uh, hadn't begun because I didn't know any of these things. Your life is about to end. Well, so often we lord it over other people and lose the capacity to identify and lead them to the truth. More than that, the Apostle Paul calls us to stop playing God in other people's lives. He says, don't repay evil for evil. Leave the vengeance up to God. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. So very often we get people to change to meet our standards rather than relate them to God so that he can help them be what he wants them to be. And very often we get people in such tension, fearing our rejection, that they change for us rather than for God. And the end result is that the change doesn't last because they don't have his power to live it out. We're told that Jonathan Edwards, when he preached his sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, that people fell into the aisles. They were so panicked. I'm not sure any of those conversions lasted very long. Anytime our conversion is based on fear, eventually we'll hate our conversion. There are a lot of religious people who go around checking up on other people and putting them down, making them fearful rather than encouraging them with love and the end result is that people try and meet their standards rather than God's. They get related to a God below God, the projection of our own image, rather than God himself. And then the Apostle Paul quotes that marvelous verse from the 25th chapter of Proverbs. You know, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals upon his head. What does that mean other than simply that by doing good to another person we want to help, we create within that person a realization of his or her need, not just for us but for God, and having related them to God, then he will give them the power to change. Remember Paul's words to Timothy, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. And with that, we are able to go to people, love them, care.
care for them, encourage them, affirm them, stand with them, and say, nothing that you ever do or say will make me stop loving you. And that's the beginning of new life for them.